Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the military will continue to fight in full force against Hezbollah, rejecting the international community's call for a 21-day ceasefire across the Lebanon-Israel border. South Korea and Japan are holding their first talk since 1985 over the joint development of an underwater continental shelf believed to hold deposits of oil and other natural resources. The UN administration has launched a national committee for AI to turn South Korea into one of the top three leading nations in the technology. We have an exclusive interview with the President or Secretary for AI and Digital to tell us what to expect from this new committee. We start in the Middle East amid a fighting between Israel and Hezbollah. Israel said it will continue to fight in full force in Lebanon, dismissing the U.S. and its allies' a calls for a ceasefire. Park Kwon reports. Fears of a possible full-scale war between Israel and Lebanon-based militant group Hezbollah escalate as Israel shows its firm stance to fight, despite the U.S. and its allies calling for a ceasefire. We are continuing to hit Hezbollah with full force and we will not stop until we achieve all our goals. First and foremost, returning the residents of the north safely to their homes. Another Israeli airstrike in the Lebanese capital Beirut on Thursday local time killed at least two people and left 15 wounded, according to Lebanon's health ministry. The commander of Hezbollah's aerial command, Mohamed Zuvur, was reportedly killed during the attack. And more Israeli strikes were made on Thursday in Lebanon, resulting in 92 people dead and over 150 wounded. Though Hezbollah hasn't yet commented about the calls for a ceasefire, it also attacked Israel with multiple rocket launches on Thursday. On the same day, Israel also conducted a military exercise to prepare for a potential ground invasion in Lebanon. Meanwhile, the U.S. and its allies have called for a ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah. The proposal for an immediate 21-day ceasefire to allow negotiations between Israel and Hezbollah was made during a statement at the UN General Assembly on Wednesday. Since the escalation in Israeli strikes on Hezbollah on Monday, nearly 700 people have been killed in Lebanon. Israel and Hezbollah have been striking each other almost daily since October 7, when the Israel-Hamas war began. Park Geun-hye, Arirang News. And the South Korean government also released a statement today calling for all parties to accept a 21-day ceasefire immediately. The Minister of Foreign Affairs said the South Korean government fully supports the joint call by the U.S., France and other nations for an immediate 21-day ceasefire along the Israel-Lebanon border. Saur urged all parties to swiftly adopt the proposal to ease regional tensions. Nearly 8 billion U.S. dollars in military assistance will be provided to Ukraine. This was according to U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday, ahead of a bilateral meeting with his Ukrainian counterpart at the White House. Isung Jha has more. As Ukraine continues to push ahead with its offensive into Russian territory while also defending its own, the U.S., its biggest supporter financially, has agreed to send more assistance. Ahead of his meeting with Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky at the White House on Thursday local time, U.S. President Joe Biden announced that nearly eight billion U.S. dollars in military aid. Right now we have to strengthen Ukraine's position on the battlefield. And that's why today I'm proud to announce a new $2.4 billion package of security assistance. I've also directed the Pentagon to allocate, to allocate all the remaining security assistance funding that has been appropriated to Ukraine, period, by the end of this, my term, which is January 20. This means $2.4 billion in security assistance through the Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative and $5.5 billion through the Presidential Drawdown Authority. Through the PDA, the U.S. can deliver surplus weapons held by the U.S. to Ukraine without congressional approval. The latest assistance announced by Biden will provide Ukraine with much-needed air defenses unmanned aerial systems, and air-to-ground munitions while strengthening Ukraine's defense industry base. The military assistance will also include a shipment of precision-guided glide weapons with a range of up to 130 kilometers. The medium-range missile will provide a major upgrade in Ukraine's fight against Russia. In response, President Zelensky thanked his U.S. counterpart for the continued support. We deeply appreciate that Ukraine and America have 
stood side by side from the very first moment of this terrible Russian invasion. Your determination is incredibly important for us to prevail. However, despite the latest assistance, a U.S. official stressed that Biden will not allow Ukraine to use U.S. missiles to hit targets deeper inside Russia. Lee Seung-jae, Arirang News. For the first time in nearly four decades, South Korea and Japan are resuming their talks on a joint development of an underwater continental shelf believed to hold mass deposits of oil and natural resources. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Peunji, has more. The Joint Development Zone is an area that has been at the center of maritime disputes between South Korea and Japan. Located south of Jeju Island, it's about 124 times the size of Seoul and lies in the waters between the two countries. A treaty was signed back in 1974 to designate the zone as a shared area for petroleum and natural gas exploration, based on analysis suggesting that the underwater continental shelf may hold a significant amount of oil and other minerals. Under the agreement, exploration and development require both nations' consent. But little development has been made in this area, as Japan made little effort to engage in joint exploration. Talks on the agreement have been suspended since 1985, with Japan having been lukewarm about moving forward with the pact. But for the first time in nearly 40 years, officials from the two countries are set to hold working-level talks on the issue in Tokyo on Friday. It will be led by Hwang jun -sik, Director General for International Legal Affairs from South Korea's Foreign Ministry, and Akihiro Okuchi, Deputy Director General for Asian and Oceanian Affairs from Japan's Foreign Ministry. Some experts in South Korea believe Japan is waiting for the agreement to expire so that it can seize the area for itself. This is because changes to the international law in the early 1980s favor a midline border between the two countries, likely benefiting Japan as the JDZ lies more than 90 percent inside of Japan's exclusive economic zone, weakening South Korea's claims to the area. The JDZ agreement is set to expire in 2028, and either of the two countries can confirm their intention to terminate the pact, starting June next year. But Seoul's foreign ministry claims even after the expiration of the agreement, neither South Korea nor Japan will have the right to develop the region without joint consent as the area will be left as an undelimited maritime area and has been urging Japan to pursue joint exploration. Peunz, Arirang News. With less than 40 days to go until the U.S. election, possibilities have been reached over North Korea conducting a seventh nuclear test around that time. Now, SARS spy agency says the regime could do so after the election. Lee Soo-jin explains. North Korea's seventh nuclear test may take place after the U.S. presidential election in November rather than before. South Korea's National Intelligence Service said in a National Assembly Intelligence Committee meeting on Thursday that there is a possibility that the test will happen after as Pyongyang has other methods of military provocation, such as intercontinental ballistic missiles and satellite launches. The North has carried out six nuclear tests since the first one in October 2006, with the last one taking place in September 2017. According to the NIS, North Korea currently possesses around 70 kilograms of plutonium as well as a significant amount of highly enriched uranium, enough to produce at least a double-digit number of nuclear weapons. As for North Korea revealing its uranium enrichment facility for the first time earlier this month, lawmakers Lee sung won and Park sun won who attended the meeting, said that the NIS assessed that it was a show of defiance ahead of the U.S. election, as well as to boost domestic morale with the demonstration of its military achievements amid worsening economic conditions. On September 13th, photos were released by the state-run Korean Central News Agency that show leader Kim Jong-un walking past rows of centrifuges that process uranium to be made into nuclear fuel, learning about the operation of its production lines. During the visit, Kim also emphasized the need to strengthen Pyongyang's nuclear capabilities. The NIS said that the facility is likely to be located in Gangseon, just outside of the capital Pyongyang, and said that it is closely monitoring the uranium enrichment site in Yongbyon. And the North's test launch of two different tactical ballistic missiles last week, one with a super-large conventional warhead and another with a strategic cruise missile, was to verify its precision strike capability.
The NIS confirmed that one out of the two missiles fired reached a target, a slight improvement compared to past tests, which also signals a growing security threat to South Korea. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. President Yoon suk yeol has launched an AI committee to build the nation's AI policies and vision as the country injects billions in hopes of becoming a major AI powerhouse. Our correspondent Oh Soo-young spoke with the president's secretary for AI to hear how South Korea will be leading the digital transformation. Right to your phone. South Korea will take the lead in innovating and shaping the future of artificial intelligence to benefit humanity. That's according to Presidential Secretary for AI and Digital Lee kyung in an interview with Arirang TV. As AI sweeps across all industries and areas of society, he said South Korea has a plan to secure its position as one of the world's top three countries leading the transformative technology. First off, we'll develop a comprehensive AI ecosystem. AI ecosystem is composed of several sectors, such as semiconductors like processors and memories, platforms or software frameworks, consumer and industrial products for on-device AI, and AI services and applications. Indeed, South Korea is one of the countries to have a unique ecosystem including all of these sectors. To secure position among the top three global AI leaders, we must elevate several South Korean companies to the forefront for their respective sectors. On Thursday, President Yoon song yeol launched a committee on AI made up of top industry experts and senior public officials to establish a national vision and framework for promoting innovation and private sector-driven growth. Well, you're known to be South Korea's top scientist in the field of AI with corporate experience as well. And yeah. what kind of uh, strengths do you think South Korea has in the field of AI and how should such advantages be leveraged? Yes, uh, South Korea has a robust AI industry already with several achievements. For instance, South Korea introduced the world's first high bandwidth memory or HBM and has established itself as a global leader in semiconductor sector. In addition, Korea was the third country in the world to launch generative AI services with large language models. The country has developed a distinctive AI ecosystem, as I mentioned earlier. Furthermore, its strong manufacturing sector helps quickly integrate AI into products like smartphones, cars, and home appliances. By leveraging these strengths to advance research and development and business models across various sectors, South Korea is well positioned to compete effectively on the global stage. But with concerns about how AI could potentially be used, a global rulebook is needed. Since taking office in 2022, President Yoon song yeol has highlighted the need for new standards and norms to ensure AI does not infringe on privacy, safety or other individual interests. The South Korean leader declared a digital bill of rights at the UN General Assembly last year. This initiative emphasizes five core values, freedom, fairness, safety, innovation and solidarity, with the aim of creating a brighter digital future for all. We are at a point where we need to maximize the innovative value brought by AI while minimizing its potential side effects and misuse through various efforts. We anticipate that AI will serve as a crucial key to ensuring in an era of shaped prosperity for humanity. Korea will take the lead in establishing a model AI society and will contribute by sharing its achievements with the international community. I see. Well, Secretary for AI and Digital, Dr. Lee kyung thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.
Now in its 10th year, StartupCon is being held in Seoul this week to support budding domestic content creator startups, including their entry into global markets. The Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism held the 10th installment of StartupCon in Songsudong District on September 26th and 27th, co-organized with Korea Creative Content Agency. The event brings together investors, experts and content creators in their early stages from both Korea and abroad to explore and share insights on global expansion and investment strategies. Showcased at this year's event were five projects that received outstanding reviews planned and produced by participants of the new Content Academy curriculum launched last October. Now, since its launch, the Academy has offered project-based courses on virtual production, virtual visualization, interaction planning, and immersive space using the latest technological trends. South Korea is looking to attract more overseas talent as part of the new immigration policy. The government introduced new visa plans in cutting-edge industries like AI that will make the immigration process and visa holders stay in Korea convenient and comfortable. Shin Ha-young has more. Amid the country's low birth rate and aging population, the government is rolling up its sleeves to get ready for a future where the foreign resident population is expected to reach 3 million. The Ministry of Justice announced a new plan on Thursday to attract overseas talent in advanced industries, which includes introducing a so-called top-tier visa. A top-tier visa will be created to attract top-skilled personnel in advanced fields such as the AI, quantum computing and aerospace sectors. It will make it more convenient for these individuals and their families both in the immigration process and throughout their stay, boosting the country's ability to attract talent and encouraging them to settle here. Support for international students in finding jobs and settling in South Korea will also be strengthened. The ministry plans to extend the period for job seeking and internships after graduation, as well as expand job opportunities to include non-professional fields. The government also decided to introduce a so-called Youth Stream in Korea visa for young people from countries that supported South Korea during the Korean War, as well as key economic partners, offering them job opportunities. The plan also includes improving the visa system and implementing tailored immigration policies to support regions in South Korea that are facing significant population decline. According to the ministry, there are currently 2.61 million foreign residents in South Korea, which is about 5 percent of the population. The government expects the new plan to bring in over 100,000 additional skilled workers in key industries within five years. Shin ha Arirang News. Peru's government declared a 60-day state of emergency in regions around its capital, Lima. On Thursday, Peruvian Prime Minister Gustavo Adrianzan announced the state of emergency had been issued in 12 districts of metropolitan Lima and the neighboring Callao province. Recently in Lima, crimes such as murder, robbery and extortion by criminal gangs have been sharply increased, especially targeting bus and taxi drivers. Since the end of August, Four drivers have been killed. Transport workers in Lima went on strike Thursday to protest demanding security against a wave of crimes. Ahead of the APEC meeting in Lima in November, the Peruvian government stated that it would expand the capacity of Chayapala prison located at the highest altitude in the world. In eastern India, at least 46 people, including 37 children and 7 women, have drawn during celebrations for the Hindu religious festival, Jivi Putirika. According to officials in the state of Bihar on Wednesday, fatalities have been confirmed across 15 districts, and the overall death toll could rise further. Mothers carry out rituals during the three-day annual religious ceremony for the prosperity and long life of their children, marked by a fasting and taking holy dips in rivers or streams. The officials said many people had ignored dangerous water levels in swollen rivers. And in fact, last year, 22 people, including 15 children, died during the same festival. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. 
We begin today in the U.S., where New York City Mayor Eric Adams has been indicted on five federal public corruption charges, including bribery, soliciting campaign contributions from foreign nationals, and wire fraud, according to a federal indictment unsealed on Thursday. According to the 57-page indictment, Adams is under fire for alleged illegal actions stretching back to 2014, following a long-running investigation that has sent the New York City government into turmoil in recent days. The indictment reads that for nearly a decade, Adams sought and accepted improper valuable benefits, such as luxury international travel, including from wealthy foreign business people and at least one Turkish government official seeking to gain influence over him. The indictment stated that Adams previously accepted over $100,000 in luxury benefits in exchange for later pressuring the NYC Fire Department to open a 36-story Turkish consular building without a fire inspection. According to Damian Williams, the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, Mayor Adams has been engaged in a long-running conspiracy, specifically saying that the New York City mayor knowingly took illegal contributions. The 64-year-old Adams said on Thursday morning that he wasn't surprised by the charges and asked the public to wait to hear our defense before making any judgments, adding that he will continue with his day-to-day -day duties. Adams' first court appearance is scheduled at noon on Friday. An 88-year-old Japanese man, who is also the world's longest-serving death row inmate, was acquitted on Thursday after serving 45 years following a wrongful conviction of murdering four people nearly 60 years ago. The Shizuoka District Court cleared Iwao Hakamada's name in a retrial of the quadruple murders that took place in central Japan back in 1966. Hakamada, a former professional boxer, was working at a miso processing plant in 1966 when the bodies of his employer and his family, the wife and two children, all of whom were stabbed to death, were recovered from a fire at their home in West Tokyo. While Hakamada was sentenced to death in 1968, he was not executed due to appeals and the retrial process led by his now 91-year-old sister, Hideko, who has been caring for her brother since his provisional release from jail in 2014. Japan's notorious prosecutor's 99% conviction rate and its slow-paced criminal justice system meant that it took Hakamada 27 years for even his first appeal for a retrial to be denied. Amnesty International celebrated Hakamada's exoneration, calling it a pivotal moment for justice. British supermodel Naomi Campbell has been banned from acting as a charity trustee in England and Wales for five years after a watchdog found charity funding had been misused, being spent on items such as luxury hotel stays, spa treatments and even cigarettes. After a three-year investigation into financial mismanagement at Fashion for Relief, the Charity Commission said on Thursday that it had found multiple instances of misconduct and or mismanagement, and that only 8.5 percent of the funds raised were spent on charitable grants from 2016 to 2022. The 54-year-old Campbell told AP News that she just found out today about the findings and I am extremely concerned. The Charity Commission said that 460,000 US dollars have been recovered and that a further $131,000 in charitable funds have been protected. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Rare September warmth continues today across Korea, except on the East Coast, where rain is in the forecast for most of the day. Easterly winds will bring downpours to eastern parts of Gangwon-do province, lashing down up 200 millimeters of downpours into Saturday. Meanwhile, inland regions could see 5 to 20 millimeters of passing showers during the day today. It could pour down once it starts to rain, but this will not not affect our top temperatures that much. That means we'll enjoy a summer-like afternoon. Most regions seeing highs of 28 degrees Celsius this afternoon. Skies will be mostly sunny when it does not rain, and air quality will be normal to good nationwide all day today.
Fine early autumn weather is in the forecast for the weekend under bright skies. Then rain next Tuesday will bring an autumn chill to the country with a huge drop in temperatures. Next Wednesday, here in the capital, we could be waking up to a low of 12 degrees Celsius. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That's all we have at this hour. Arirang News will be back at 2 p.m. Korea time. Thanks for watching.